Yeah, community matters, troubling sea changes in China. Okay, with um, uh, Marco Marco Polo. <laughs> Let me change that to Marco Mangelsdorf. Uh, and Marco Polo is, is an apt uh, parallel, though. Marco, welcome to the show. It's always great to talk to you. And this time about China, really great. Well, ni hao, horapongyo. Hello, my friend. Thank you for having me on. Always appreciate it. Well, you and I have been trading articles, you know, we're respected journals and news organizations, and it seems like the pitch is getting higher. Um, China is getting more aggressive. Uh, its rhetoric is more aggressive. Its um, military mm, demonstrations, expression of power getting greater. And that includes not only economic power, which is really formidable when you look at Belt Road, um, but also, you know, um, geopolitically with Taiwan. And I think we, we're living in a time where we're ramping up to some horrible crescendo in Asia all around China's ambitions. How do you feel about that? Oh, how do I feel about that? Uh, well, of course, the, the folks in Beijing, the leadership in Beijing sees things very, very differently the way, than the way you just described it. And, you know, just as a little bit of background, uh, I, I've been in China probably between 12 to 15 times over the past 20 years. And I have developed over time a real fondness for and a lot of aloha for uh, the Chinese people writ large, Chinese history, Chinese culture, Chinese traditions. I have a tremendous amount of respect and aloha for, for the Chinese writ large. And I'm trying to find my way through what is being reported by so many uh, Western uh, sources in terms of Chinese behavior in Xinjiang, Chinese behavior in Tibet, Chinese. When I say Chinese behavior, I'm talking about uh, the Communist Party leadership and the state apparatus in Beijing, their behavior in Hong Kong, their behavior towards Taiwan, their behavior in the so-called Nine Dash Line or South China Sea. And I also read pretty much daily uh, the Chinese press. So it's, it's, it's a, a dissonant, dissonant messages I'm getting from our press versus the Chinese press. So to circle back to your question, how do I feel about it? I feel a, a tremendous amount of concern and anxiety, uh, more so than I've ever felt in the decades that I've been uh, focusing on international relations uh, and global security issues and matters. So that's, that's my, my quick answer for you. Not so quick, actually, but I feel very, very concerned. Well, what, what particular scenarios give you concern? I'd say what's going on over the Taiwan Strait. There's this body of water or a passage of water uh, between the island of Taiwan and the Chinese mainland which is fairly narrow. In other words, there's not a whole lot of geographic distance to separate, separates the People's Republic of China with the de facto Republic of China, which while it may not have de jure independence, depending on who you talk to, there's really little case that can be made. Uh, I mean, it, it has de facto and has had de facto independence for decades. And the rhetoric on both sides by both sides, I mean coming from Beijing and coming from Washington and coming from a number of other parts of the world, including Japan, including Australia, including parts of Southeast Asia, including a number of European countries, both Eastern Europe and Western Europe and the UK, that there is a growing uh, chorus of concern over the more uh, I don't want to necessarily say aggressive, but at least certainly much more active uh, behavior from Beijing in terms of trying to bring Taiwan to heal. What do I mean bringing Taiwan to heal? I mean, since the revolution to, uh, took place in uh, October 1949 with the success of Mao Zedong and the communists in, on the mainland, you know, the, the existence of, uh, of these now 24, almost 24 million people on the island of Taiwan has been one of the, the most painful thorns in the side of the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party over the decades. 
and Xi Jinping, a self-described, self-proclaimed uh, core leader, core leader of, of China and leader of the Chinese Communist Party, has made very clear in his rhetoric over the months that the patience uh, on the part of Beijing, the patience on the part of the mainland, the patience on the part of the leadership is wearing thin as far as the Taiwanese coming back into the fold of the motherland. And the, the rhetoric is just off the charts uh, from, from Beijing. And one of the pieces I read just in the past week in the admittedly rather nationalist Global Times, which is an English language, uh, Chinese, official Chinese uh, media source essentially, describes the Biden administration in, 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 in the most harsh terms I've ever seen. I think they were really hoping, really hoping that there would be a positive change after Donald Trump left office in January as far as American Sino policy, American Sino relations. And I think, you know, now that we're a number of months into it, almost the end of 2021, there is the growing conclusion amongst the leadership in Beijing that the Biden administration does not represent much of a positive change. And in fact, according to the rhetoric they're using, represents an, uh, a, a further deterioration of, of American policy, in their view, American policy towards the Chinese or China. So uh, I think I'll pause now and uh, catch my breath and allow you to respond. Hmm. Well, you know, uh, we should talk about why, but let's connect some dots. You got Tibet, Mongolia, got uh, Taiwan, got Hong Kong. You got Belt Road with the debt traps. You got huge uh, investments and development of um, natural resources uh, in Africa, in Latin America. Um, I guess I could go on, but uh, it, it surely seems to me that China is on a roll economically and militarily in the, in the past 25 years it has developed a, a very powerful military with lots of carriers and i i rem, i'm one of the people who remember when they had no carriers at all now they have Jay, lots of carriers two, two carriers two carriers okay two carriers i don't know if that qualifies for law okay all right well you know more and then now they have these um, missiles that fly supersonically hypersonic Hypersonic. You can say that's small stuff, but it's not small stuff because those missiles could reach anywhere in the world in 30 minutes. So, I mean, they've been very aggressive. They spent a lot of money on the military, and uh, they, they, their, their rhetoric is not only against uh, you know, Taiwan and Hong Kong, it's against, against the U.S. calling the U.S. Uh, you know a, a failing, a failing power. Um, which in some ways, you know, you really can't argue with that. We haven't been able to get our government together since uh, before Trump. <clears throat> and so um, I think they're, they're pushing it. And the reason I don't understand, why, why do they care so much about, for example, Taiwan? Can't they let it go? Why do they uh, care about the, the islands out there? Well, can't they let that go? Things are working fine before. What do they need from, you know, Tibet, Mongolia? Um, can't they let that go? And I think they're making moves economically that are, you know, mm, aggressive, but unnecessary. Did he really have to be president for life? Does he really have to control uh, and uh, suppress dissent? Does he really have to put people in retraining camps in, in Xinjiang? Is that really necessary? It's necessary to his form of government, it's necessary to his vision. And yet, this is exactly what's happening. So that, you know, the threat to the United States is only a part of what he has in mind. That's my reaction. Well, you've said a lot there, Jay, and let me kind of give you my, my take on, on some of what you said. If you, you look back to the founding of the People's Republic of China, October 1949, and from 49 until at least sometime during the 1980s, maybe early 1990s, uh, so much of the Chinese 
mindset, the Chinese persona, and I'm making a, a broad generalization here, uh, was had an underlying understructure of of concern of 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 anxiety over over scarcity. I mean, there were times under Mao from 49 to 76 where people million by the millions died of starvation. There was the tumult over 10 years from 1966 to 76 of the cultural, the great proletarian cultural revolution, which was very, very much an upheaval for so many millions of people. So there's kind of this base insecurity, I would say, within the Chinese, the Chinese uh, spirit, so to speak, within the Chinese mindset, the Chinese persona, there's this base insecurity. And despite the fact that over the past decades, China has made strides that have been historic in, in the history of humanity in terms of, of improvements of, of uh, material benefits, bringing people out of poverty, uh, less people starving, uh, greater material security. I mean, for that, China is truly an exemplar. I mean, it's come at a significant cost, I would argue, especially uh, regarding environmental damage, amongst other things. But I mean, they've come a long way in a very short period of time. But regardless of that, regardless of the fact that they're the world's second largest economy, regardless of the fact that they are now challenging the United States for, although they would never cop to this, that they're challenging the United States for, in a sense, kind of global supremacy, there's the deep, deep, deep insecurity on the part of the, the leadership in China. And they see it from their perspective that they're not being aggressive, they're not being expansive, that they are just coming back into their own. And uh, the, the, one of the catchphrases in China over the years under Xi has been in the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And that's their perspective. So, I mean, you want to look at some of the issue areas you, you spoke about. I mean, Tibet is, makes a big portion, makes up a big portion geographically of the entire, tiny, the entire People's Republic of China. And they, they have a history, their history, in quotation marks, their history, uh, allows them to essentially conclude that that part of China now has long been a part of China. So, you know, it's a non-starter to them to talk about more freedom in Tibet, because in, in their view, Tibet has long been Chinese. Uh, the same with Mongolia. Now, Hong Kong, well, yeah, you know, that's kind of a different story. We're seeing uh, you know, according to, to a number of legitimate analyses, in my view, uh, what's been happening in Hong Kong over the past two years has been a de facto abrogation of the 1997 agreement between Beijing and between the UK in terms of 50 years, allowing for 50 years from 1997 on of a rather, uh, shall we say, independent nature uh, of, of, of the status of Hong Kong. Well, that certainly has changed. Right. So again, I mean, the perspectives are so different here from Beijing compared to Washington or Beijing compared to, to, to London. And you know, my, my, my two big concerns right now, Jay, are that, and I don't have any inside information about this because the upper levels of the Chinese leadership is incredibly opaque. I mean, we can identify individuals, we can try to come up with bios, both the CIA and the NSA on our side you know, spend lots of time trying to game out who's really on top there, who has this position, who has what or that position. But one of my concerns about any type of government that, is, that does not allow for open debate of different positions, and I think autocratic governments, let alone dictatorial governments, are more prone to not having open and free debate, period, right? Nor open and free debate at the top echelons of power. My big concern is that Xi Jinping and his top leadership are not hearing any possible dissenting voices or voices of caution in terms of uh, China's uh, expansionist or China's uh, greater uh, act activity in the international sphere. So that's, that's concern number one, is that I really wonder to what extent there's any type of open debate, open and honest debate of different positions within the top echelons of the Chinese leadership. And second, I have a very difficult time seeing an off-ramp here. I just see this, this crescendo, this building up of more and more tension between both uh, the United States and our allies and, and China and its allies, but 
less so its allies. I mean, it's really it's really kind of the the two the two principal figures in this drama is are the Americans and the Chinese. And I, I have a difficult time seeing a, a near term peaceful off ramp. It just seems to be uh, it, it's going in the wrong direction. The, the 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 tension is ramping up. The threats are ramping up. And you know, Beijing has said repeatedly, they refer to these red lines, red lines, core interests, red lines, and they are saying among us on a daily basis that their red lines are being violated regarding Taiwan. And now with uh, Tsai Ing-wen, who is the duly elected leader of Taiwan, she won re-election not too long ago and is serving her second and last term. I mean, she has been quite active uh, in the media as of late. She penned a piece in Foreign Affairs uh, that came out several weeks ago. She's been doing interviews with the Western press and Western media. She admitted that there is in fact a number uh, that she did not define, that she did not enumerate a number of American military forces there on the ground in Taiwan who are engaged in training activities with the Taiwanese military. So the, the, Beijing is talking about this red line being broached and that red line being broached and we have to take action. Well, I mean, they've already been testing the air ID zone, the security zone essentially to the southwest of the island of Taiwan, the Chinese military and the PLA have been repeatedly sending up military aircraft, not not over flying Taiwan proper, because that is a red line in their view that they have yet to cross, but they have been consistently testing the air defense zone around Taiwan with more and more active uh, sorties that is causing, of course, the Taiwanese military to scramble, putting a greater strain on their resources and so forth and so on. So again, I'm having a hard time seeing an off ramp here, Jay, in terms of how are things gonna calm down. Well, a couple of thoughts about what you said. Number one is, uh, I certainly agree that there's this kind of uh, flavor of manifest destiny uh, based on historical perceptions or misperceptions of exactly where China was or has been over the past millennia. Um, and I would, I would say that it's making a lot of this up. Xi Jinping is making it up so as to justify his aggressive geopolitical ambitions. Um, nevertheless, that's what he says and does. The other part of it is that they're showing that their system works better. Uh, they don't want transparency. They see transparency in this country, and they can rightly conclude that transparency doesn't work, and that democracy has some real mm, problems in it, some flaws. One of them is transparency. They feel that uh, if you let, you know, let the Politburo and the powers, the, the silent secret powers run the government and support this one man who speaks for everyone, um, you know, then that works better. And you don't get a chance to quiz and interview. You don't get a chance to argue with and advocate for other positions with other people in the government. So I, I think they probably believe it's better that way. Unfortunately, they don't realize what, what you're saying is that um, it, is, it is better to have um, you know, an open government. It is better to know who's saying what, who's doing what, how decisions are being made, and have the public the, you know, who live there being involved in the process. They don't, I don't think they do that or get that at all. But here we are, and um, you know, Obama's pivot has stopped. In fact, it was incomplete at the start. Um, and Trump and, and Joe Biden have really not pursued it. And we don't have the pivot to Asia. We're not paying attention to Asia. We've been paying attention to the Middle East and Europe um, and other places, but not Asia, not China. And I think we're you know, at the wrong end of the stick and Xi Jinping knows that. So he sees this as an opportunity in the islands and uh, for uh, Taiwan in general. And you know, he's, it's interesting how he plays it on the one hand, you know, he's uh, all over the uh, United Nations uh, trying to insinuate himself into the process and decision making in the United Nations. On the other hand, he doesn't abide by the international court on whether he has a right to build those islands. So, you know, you, it's like heads I win and tails you lose. Uh, so he's, he's manipulating the international process and press. Um, so. Uh, you know, the, the, the real question here, and I certainly agree that, that China versus the U.S., China competing with the U.S. economically, of course, because I think China believes in that first. 
but also militarily as an adjunct to the economic competition, um, they're, they're being very aggressive. And, and we are we're not so engaged. Our government is not so engaged. And frankly, our military is not so engaged. Uh, we have this uh, notice, this um, comp, this, um, uh, this comp, this um, belief in exceptionalism and that we are okay no matter what. We are the strongest country in the world and we will always be the strongest country in the world economically and militarily. And that simply isn't true anymore. And I, I think China is um, moving fast on that and we are moving backward on that. So the problem with the military is uh, they may think that they have the edge on Taiwan. They may think they can stop, deflect, de defer, deter, and attack on Taiwan. I, I think a lot of commentators don't agree. And that if uh, in two or three or five years, if China want to wants to make a military move on Taiwan, we won't be ready and, and they will. I think right now, as one commentator put it, I think you've seen this article too, right now it's premature for China to do that. But as time goes by, it'll be less premature and it'll be more likely of success. And that's the, that's the big play to take over um, Asia, take over Asia and get us out. You know, one of those historical rubs has been, you know, why is the United States here? What right does it have to be all around us? Why don't we just kind of, you know, develop a strategy to get rid of them uh, from Taiwan and all around Asia uh, and their friends? And I think they're working in that way. And I think they're succeeding in that way. And I think Joe Biden has so much on his plate and the military is, you know, the military should not be determining this policy. The president should, and nobody is. Well, I'd beg to differ a little bit, my friend, in that- uh, You always do, Marco. It's okay. Yeah, I, I, know I, you I forgive you in advance. Yeah. You expect that of me. Uh, Joe Biden has actually been fairly vocal uh, of, of recent time. I want to ask about Taiwan. He did a town hall with Anderson Cooper a week or so ago. And he's made clear uh, that uh, Taiwan is important to him, at least if you believe the rhetoric. Now, the, the, the open question is, uh, when push comes to shove, what is this, quote, rock solid, close quote, rock solid commitment that the United States has to Taipei? Because that's the go-to phraseology. That our commitment, our relationship with the Taiwanese is, quote, rock solid. What does that mean in the context, the backdrop, uh, backdrop of the so-called strategic ambiguity, right? But I mean, the president has been vocal about Taiwan. Uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken has been vocal about Taiwan. Uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, has been vocal about Taiwan and, and the hypersonic uh, tests that we witnessed uh, in, in months gone by. So I, I would beg to differ with you in terms of, I think uh, folks in the State Department, folks in the, the president uh, and his staff, folks in the, in the Department of Defense, are paying very keen attention to what's going on uh, regarding the Chinese as far as both Taiwan and the South China Sea. And you know, one of the things that Biden has done uh, in contrast to his predecessor is he's been able to bandwagon more of our friends because you know, Mr. Trump didn't really care all that much for a lot of our, our shall we say, foreign friends, right? And Biden has refocused uh, understandably so, and I support this, so focused on making sure that our relationships with Japan, with Australia, with India, with the Europeans, our traditional democratic allies, right, that that these relationships are strengthened and they have been strengthening. Well, so, yeah, but that's, that's it's very recent. The, uh, the submarine deal um, where, where we, um, uh, you know, took over from France and got into a submarine mm, development uh, agreement with uh, Australia. Um, and of course, um, the Quad, the Quad, Australia, the US, uh, India, and was one other, I think it's Japan. Japan. Yeah. Japan. So, yeah. I mean, all of that is in the becoming. It's, it's not solid yet. It's, uh, it's a good idea and he should do that, but it won't be a formidable arrangement, China, for a while. And, and some people have argued that now is the time for China to really uh, feel its oats because the, the quad deal has not come together yet. And uh, its opportunities are greater now than they will be uh, when the quad does come together. Well, I mean, 
ultimately, and, and the risk of being overly simplistic here, ultimately, the top leadership in, in Beijing is going to be and is constantly assessing risk reward, right? Cost benefit. And they've made clear that they are never, never going to let go of a part of what they feel to be an integral part of their motherland, which is Taiwan. So the question then becomes, well, they've said going from, from Deng Xiaoping and beyond, and from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping, uh, that uh, their preference is to do it by peaceful means, right? They've always emphasized that, but they've never ruled out if it's so if they so choose to do it by other than peaceful means. So, well, this rhetoric what, doesn't sound like peaceful at all. This rhetoric, uh, you know, keeps on keeps on talking about a takeover by military force. Now, of course, that could be just talk. A lot of what happens could be just talk. But they're, if they were talking about taking over by peaceful means uh, a few years ago, they're not talking about that now. And the question really, their measurement, right. their measurement has to be, what will the United States do? If they take, you know, uh, if they take uh, adventurous moves, what will the United States do? Well, the United States didn't do anything in Hong Kong. The United States didn't do anything with the islands. United States, you know, the United States has seen China grow its territory of, by leaps and bounds and its economic prowess by leaps and bounds. We haven't matched them. We don't have a Belt Road. We don't we don't make big loans, uh, you know, to ports and infrastructure. We can't even do our own. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not like um, we're 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 a real tiger. We're a paper tiger. And the question I put to you, and this is a big central question, in all of this is if they took over Taiwan. Um, peaceful would be better, you know, for them too. But if they took over Taiwan by threat or force, what would the United States do? And let me put it this way: even if Joe Biden feels he wants to protect Taiwan, and maybe he does, can he? Remember what happened in Afghanistan, uh, where you know the powers in Congress were all yelling at him, "You got to get out!" Both left and right, you got to get out. Um, would they encourage, would they allow, would they enable him, would they fund him for a, a, a military uh, adventure around Taiwan? I, I really question that. What do you think? Well, let me give you one little factoid data point, which I think is, uh, in, is important to, to note, which is that according to polling, recent polling uh, across Taiwan, somewhere, somewhere in the mid to high 80s of those polled said, in response to the question, well, what do you what do you feel uh, as far as the status quo between Taiwan and Beijing, or that we declare formal independence, de jure independence, or that we reunify with the mainland? Those were, I believe, the three choices to the survey question. Uh, well over eighty percent said status quo. And then you had a teeny tiny minority who were saying reunite with the mainland, and you had a, also a small minority saying declare independence. So I, I think it's reasonable to observe the very, very large majority of Taiwanese, about 23 million of them, favor the status quo, which is de facto independence, right? And a vibrant democracy and a fairly transparent one, right? And liberal democratic institutions. So that to me is a core reality, speaking of core things, right? It's the people of Taiwan want things to continue as is and not be under the umbrella of Beijing. So, you know, as far as what can we do, what can Washington do, what can we do with our allies, what should we do? You know, one core reality, Jay, and the Chinese are fond of bringing this up whenever they feel it's appropriate, is that Taiwan means more to them than it means to us. And I, I happen to believe that. I think it would be foolish to dispute that notion. Taiwan means more to them than it means to us. Plus, it's a hell of a lot closer, and there are for, for a whole bunch of reasons, right? So, granted that fundamental reality and that the strategic ambiguity that we've been practicing since the so called Taiwan Relations Act of 1979 under Jimmy Carter, in fact, where we formally, we, the United States, switched our, our recognition from Taiwan to the People's Republic of China. 
Uh, so now we're going on about 50 plus years, no, sorry, 40 plus years, 40 plus years of the strategic ambiguity, right? And, and a number of people from both the left and the right side of the political spectrum are saying, it's time to dump strategic ambiguity. Well, I see a great risk in that because again, I'm looking for an off ramp here and what can we do what can we do to try to maintain the status quo? That's really like the hokey pokey, right, Jay? That's what it's all about here, in my view, to maintain the status quo of an independent, de facto independent Republic of Taiwan. Is how, how can we, how can we, or Republic of China, excuse me, ROC. Uh, how can we try to do our best in the United States from a policy perspective, from a rhetorical perspective, try to maintain the, the status quo of an independent, de facto independent Republic of China, the island of Taiwan. And we're threading a needle here. We're threading a needle big time in terms of trying to raise the costs of a possible military move on the part of Beijing against the Taiwanese. We're trying to raise the cost in their estimation of costs and benefits so that they don't pull the trigger on doing overflights of the island directly, which would be which would trigger an anti-aircraft response undoubtedly from the Taiwanese, or that they do some massive cyber attack to cripple the, the command and control of, of Taiwan. What can we do to try to raise the cost and their cost benefit analysis? And you know, it's just Marco and Jay and Jay and Marco talking here. So I don't have the briefing books the President of the United States has. I don't have the intel that the CIA has been developing, but I mean. Well, one of, one of the points in those briefing books is going to be the secondary effect. <clears throat> if, if they uh, make aggressive moves against Taiwan and we respond with aggressive moves, um, shooting their planes down, what have you, um, then you, you risk war. And that's another yeah. part of the, the rhetoric that comes from Xi Jinping. And a lot of commentators also feel that within the next five or 10 years, we may well have fisticuffs with China. And you know, a lot of people have said, well, may, and, and you, you remind me of this, uh, you say, well, it won't necessarily be, um, you know, with, with hypersonic missiles. It might be with, um, you know, with, with cyber, cyber attacks, which can be devastating, which could be devastating on Taiwan too. Uh, and maybe that's, you know, that's what they would do uh, to be more aggressive. But, you know, I keep thinking, and we had a show about this just last hour, um, about voting rights in the United States, uh, where right now, you know, the Democrats have a thin majority. They can't do too much with that. Uh, they can't support Biden's initiatives. I'm sorry. Uh, and in two, 2022, 2024, there is at least a fair chance with all the confusion about voting rights that the Republicans will argue be in charge. And one of their elements is right or wrong is uh, isolationism. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to, they're racist also. They don't want to get involved in Asia. Just let, let it happen, whatever it is. So maintaining the status quo when that becomes visible, you know, and in fact, likely, uh, maintaining the status quo in the face of a paper tiger military that responds to a paper tiger government who's isolationist, um, it doesn't present much of an obstacle to China. I think they will have their way. I'm not sure what their way will be, I think they will have their way. Well, you said a lot there, and I prefer not to uh, get too far out there in terms of what's going to happen in 2024 uh, as far as the direction of, of, of the United States. Uh, we've got a lot of living to do uh, from now until then. A lot of things can happen. And uh, to, to, to go kind of on another track here a little bit, day one that I'm, I'm you know, very interested in, in as well, is, you know, you look back over uh, the People's Republic of China and the, the leadership that they've had, you know, after Mao died in 76, uh, there was the, 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 the common consensus really that having one person in power for as long as Mao in power really wasn't such a good idea. And Deng Xiaoping was purged and brought back and purged and brought back a number of times. But ultimately, late 70s, he became paramount leader, right? Never the leader of the Communist Party, never the leader of the party, but he was the power behind the power. And from Mao to 2012, at least, from Mao to 2012, 
there was a, an agreed upon, at least in principle, there was a consensus that there should be leadership changes at the top of the Chinese Communist Party, and therefore the top, top of, the, of the state government as well, because the party and, and the government you know, work hand in hand. So there was the understanding essentially up until Xi Jinping that the party leader would, would serve 10 years or two five-year terms and then give way to the next leadership cohort, right? And lo and behold, now we're coming up on the end of Xi Jinping's second five-year term and there's every indication that this, uh, this precedent or this tradition of leadership changes after 10 years has been tossed by Xi and, his, and his, his group. So it's interesting to note, and even though there's very little discussion in the Chinese press or amongst in, in the uh, Chinese academic circles as to the wisdom of chucking this 10 year term limit, essentially, I, I feel very confident saying that there's no shortage of very bright educated Chinese who are concerned. Now they may not, tell that to a Western reporter or to a Western friend necessarily, because it's kind of risky these days. But there is concern within China in certain circles that Mr. Xi Jinping uh, is going a bit too far in terms of amassing so much power and now pushing himself uh, essentially as, as the new Mao, as the next Mao. In fact, interestingly, and don't think this is just, uh, this is just happenstance, when you see these large gatherings in Beijing in front of Tiananmen Square and the Heavenly Gate there, which is kind of the, you know, the heart and soul in a sense, symbolically of China, right? That is you have Xi Jinping with people to the left of him and people to the right of him, the leadership, right? Everybody except Xi is wearing a Western suit, black jacket, white shirt with typically a red tie. The only one who's not conforming is Xi Jinping. You know what he's wearing? He's wearing a so-called Mao suit. And that's very purposeful to set him apart from the other leaders and, and have him be essentially associated with the, the great helmsman, right? The founder of the Communist Party, not the founder of the Communist Party, but the, the original late great leader of the Communist Party, who it used to be back in the day, and I'm not sure what they're saying now, but you would ask, you know, common Chinese person you know, what do you think about Mao? Their standard response says, well, he was 70% good and 30% not so good. So I'm thinking, you know, they may, that percentage may be higher now in terms of, well, he's 80% good or was 90% good. So my point here is that internally in China, uh, it's clear that Xi Jinping has amassed more power and who knows when he, the core leader would leave, you know, we'll know certainly by next year when it's official, most likely that he has been approved, voted on for another who knows how long. Uh, but, um, but this is a source of concern, you know, for me, for I think a number of Chinese, that this is one man who seems to be going further and farther in terms of his accumulation of power and authority that, uh, uh, that perhaps isn't all that uh, good for, for China itself. Yeah, well, he's certainly been more and more authoritarian. And I know people too who are concerned about that people in China or have been in China, <clears throat> have China connections, and they're also concerned about that. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, he's also in charge of foreign policy. Uh, he has a lot to do with every, because he's so powerful, he has a lot to do with everything that happens. And that is of great concern, you know, Absolute power does corrupt absolutely. That's what they say. So you and I have to follow this, Marco. There's more to come. This is, um, you know, a huge big thing. I wouldn't say it's as big as climate change, but it's really big. Uh, thank you for joining me in this discussion, Marco. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we uh, covered some some juicy ground today. So uh, may may we may it continue. Thank you so much. Aloha. Bye bye.